Hey, I'm Mike Markoff, and you're watching Rocking at the Movies with Shane Comley White. Welcome back to Rocking at the Movies with me, Shane Comley White. Today's guest is a multi award winner, an actor who plays in action, horrors, and romance, and is known for his recent role as Craig in the 2024 movie Hitman. I would like to welcome Mike Markoff. Mike, jumping straight into it, what kind of roles do you gravitate to? And do you feel you have been typecast as a villain or the bad guy in any of those roles? I can't say that I've just been typically typecast. There's been all kinds of things. I, I thought never in a million years am I going to be like your romantic lead. And then like COVID happens and I start doing all these fucking Lifetime movies, you know, you know, doing yeah. these like steamy romance things. And I kind of enjoyed it. I think there's something so interesting character wise and character relationship wise about about falling in love. I mean, it's one of the most provocative and interesting things that we encounter uh, as human beings on Earth, right? Um, and going through all those things. And I found that to be fascinating. And I didn't think that would be fascinating. I'd be like, oh, these losers, these vanilla cupcake dudes just on TV doing this like crappy stuff, trying to be handsome, trying to be cool, or whatever. I'm like, no, this is actually like a super real experience. My experience doing some of these uh, Lifetime movies were just really fantastic. And then, and then, yeah, I've done also done a couple of these kind of like typical protagonist uh leading man kind of things before i did this great film really fantastic movie that i was so proud to be a part of called when jack came back which i played opposite lindsey wagner in played my mom yeah. and like lance hendrickson was my dad i'm like well i've got the coolest parents ever and it was an incredibly wonderful story and it was such a it was the it was the one kind of role where it, there was no real departure from me it was yeah. the, the the movie was about an actor who has to leave his career behind to go take care of his mother with Alzheimer's after his father passes, you know, out in the Midwest where I'm from. And so basically to answer your question in this long winded way, but to kind of consolidate it down, all, the, all different types of shit have kind of come at me. I've found enjoyment in all of them. And I, I hope, I hope it kind of continues that way. Yeah. No, because um, the reason why I asked that is uh, quite a few people that I have asked, as well. they, they say that they prefer specific roles because they find that it's it's a release from the the norm they, they can actually be someone that they aren't normally and just carry on with that and enjoy it and so for example totally. Eric, it's um, yeah, yeah. he he told me that he loves playing the bad person or the bad guy and the reason for that is because he can't be that in moral life or in real life he's so okay. nice and he's so nice in, in normal life which is yeah that makes sense it made him. Uh, he, I, well, actually, I mean, there's like a three way, a three way connection here. When I looked at who you've interviewed in the past, I did a movie mm -hmm. where uh, he played my dad. Yes. And, so. and uh, it was this movie called The Cove, which we did around COVID. It was like a zombie film That's because. When you guys broke into like shipyards and all that kind of stuff, right? So some, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so. <laughs> told us about that. And Tony, who I believe you interviewed too, was one of my henchmen. You know, Dolph Dolph Lundgren's yes. uh, double. Stunt double. He, he was one of yeah. He was one of my uh, uh, he was one of my henchmen, and um, I didn't meet Eric on that shoot because they shot his stuff separately. But yeah, he was my dad, and uh, and and sort of uh, yeah. That was a that was a wild shoot. That was a I was playing a diabolical character, super straight. It's still like it wasn't like a huge movie, but it's like my. It's my best reviewed performance, like, because I literally, the director, uh, Robert, is a fantastic guy, he just let me improvise and chew the ever-living shit out of these scenes in this, this true, true psychopathic character who's strangely funny and likable, but seriously kind of disgusting. And yeah, I had a great time. I was, you know, we had this scene with, with Tony and a bunch of my henchmen and I'm just like laying it into these guys and they're looking at my character. Like, is there, is, is there something mentally wrong with him? Is he like, is he, is he like strangely sexually frustrated? What's going on here? And it was just, uh, it was, it was COVID. We didn't like the streets were bare so we could easily make a zombie apocalypse movie. So we did. Yeah. yeah. Now I remember all the stories that, um, both Tony and Eric told me as well. It was breaking into shipyards for example just because you couldn't get all the permissions to go film and it was a a smaller budget project 
So you had to kind of gorilla shoot to like, <laughs> your way oh, yeah. to some of the people, which is totally. sometimes one of the best ways, you know. Um, but no, that, that's where I got into the whole directing and, and, and all of that as well. It's because of these interviews with people like yourself. And it's it's incredible to know what you've gone through, how you've done it, and what you like, because it's, it's kind of giving me the reassurance of, okay, it's good. It's good to do. And I'm sure for all the other viewers as well that are in the acting world, it's the same thing. They like that real people can do things that are out of the norm. You know? So being a diabolical character is something not everyone can do. <laughs> so good for you. Oh, then you yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I know. No, yeah, no doubt. It's a great time playing those roles to speak to what Eric says, having the opportunity, um, to, to experience things that we don't get to experience in our normal life, because that's the key as an actor. And the only reason, and, and this is, this is an opinion here, but I think the best actors are people that can truly, they just naturally truly believe in these imaginary circumstances and they believe in them so hard so hard that they think the thoughts of that character that they're that they're there and that's sometimes sometimes i mean most of the times it's it's very pleasurable to be able to to do that to experience these other circumstances granted sometimes it's also like painful but there's pleasure in the pain too yeah no definitely um it's to to get into the role and like you say be what you are um i've I started to realize that a lot of people that i've dealt with are, or try to overact and they try to be something that they're not and they don't actually fit that role that they are trying to portray and it comes across as a little bit cheesy and a little bit corny um, but the ones that are actually embodying that character you can tell the difference straight away it's amazing when you can see the the quality of acting when it comes to that now obviously I'm still a very small fry in the industry <laughs> but um, trying our best we're doing much again uh, yeah, yeah. okay so the reason why I asked about you prefer the the darker kind of movies and the darker roles. Tell us about Doctor, your your Doctor role in um, The Little Mermaid. Yeah, this is um, yeah, this is super interesting. This is a, I mean, that character is a full on protagonist in a very in in what is likely to be a, a dark film. I haven't seen this movie yet. Of course, it's not out. Okay. Uh, Grindstone Lionsgate will be releasing it, you know, when they when they see fit. Um, but I had a I had a hell of a time working on that, and you know how sometimes you do a movie, and then you also wonder how it's kind of being marketed. And granted, they, the the marketing push for this movie hasn't happened yet, but it does seem like they're going to lean into some of the more thriller or, or horror components of this film. But it was a film that we did earnestly in this very. I mean, very impressive and cleverly written script that sort of takes Hans Christian Andersen's uh, Little Mermaid story and kind of mashes it up with uh, with Dagon. If you're if you're familiar, um, and and it's the the movie itself is 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 funny. It's adventure like, and and though it's earnest, it also kind of has fun with itself a bit and because look you know how do you just nonchalantly get a mermaid involved in a movie and try to make it you know serious They're like and so there was a lot of great moments in this film while we were making it where like i'm sorry but like i'm just not if, if i'm a ra if i'm a rational person playing a rational character and i just see a fucking mermaid I'm going to address like the ridiculousness and hilarity of it, which we did like, yeah. and so many real, like great kind of moments with that, like the, the, the fuckery of something supernatural happens. We're so used to seeing fantastical things happen in film, uh, supernatural things, you know, of course I, I really try to, I really try to put myself into these circumstances of, if I just, if I was just, you know, in an underwater exploration and a shark is coming after me and I get saved by what looks like, it's a little fuzzy. It looks like a fucking mermaid. Not only does it look like a mermaid, she's got red hair. Not looking like the little girl from the cartoon. I'm just like, okay, everyone just, 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 just hold the phone for a second here. Okay. That, that was, that was a, 
a motherfucking mermaid. It's just no one gonna. So we had a lot of those moments. So when, when I say the movie's kind of like an earnest approach, but a fun approach. And granted, there's horror elements to it too that are fantastic. You know, this version, in order for her to walk on land, she may have to get a taste of human flesh. So there's going to be some casualties, and it's going to be fun. I uh, like I said, I haven't seen it, but I'm excited. And I also just it was cool, kind of having this sort of earnest kind of character. I keep using the word earnest because that's the, that's the word that always comes up with this movie. Um, because he's you know, a little Indiana Jonesy, but a lot more imperfect, a little bit less confident, okay. slightly lovable and stupid, but exceptionally smart. I don't know if the audience yeah. is going to be rooting for this fellow, but I had a damn good time doing it. So, I think that's all that matters. And then you make a movie for yourself, and if the audience loves it, then fantastic. You know, if not, just doing yours. You did it. You know? uh, look, I'll just have a small existential crisis if it gets you know a bad <laughs> review where they tell me I suck, and then I'll. Hopefully, get over that by lunch and move on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's the only way to do it. You have to have that little breakdown. Yeah, yeah. So, out of all the movies that you've done, what is your. What is the one that stands out to you most? What's the one that's most impactful to you in, in, in feeling, in emotion, in growth, all of those aspects for you? Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a really fantastic. It's a really fantastic question, Shane. Um, you know, first and foremost, obviously working with Richard Linklater on Hitman was, um, and, and with Glenn Powell was a, was a big standout for me, of, of course, for the obvious reasons, but to get kind of like candid and vulnerable for a second, even after like maybe like 60 credits under my belt, there's always the voice in your head that says, um, you know, like, can you actually really do this? And always a bit of an imposter syndrome and always a bit of like, people are going to find out that I suck or I haven't done this on a stage that's particularly open to, to real critical review or anything, or it just, you know, goes on Tubi or Amazon or wherever the hell, or, you know, and this was one experience where in making this film and obviously the fantastic aftermath has been so affirmational uh for me shooting that scene which was ridiculously long like 12 pages of back and forth dialogue with me and, and, and the lead and to be directed by one of the most discerning and oscar nominated actors and one of or pardon uh directors um and, and and really doing the thing and feeling so great about it i remember after we we shot that day i uh i went uh, back to my hotel, I've scooped up my fiance, and we went to dinner. I just sat there with this for the first time in my life, knowing fully in my heart that I'm in the right place, doing the right thing. Because I had I had taken a break from it. I, I left acting for a good while in my 20s, and I I fucked off overseas doing jack shit for a long time. And coming back to it, I, I had this kind of mantra that. This is not the be-all, end-all for me. I'm going to do this because I enjoy doing this. Because I have something to say, I think. And if I decide to be a farmer tomorrow, then I'm going to grow cabbages and pickle them and probably enjoy it. I might still do that. I'm threatening to become a farmer at any second here. But like a cool farmer that doesn't have to do too much work. Like there would be help. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I, my, my, answers, like my answers to your questions are getting stranger and stranger. So That's fine, because that, that makes it nice. And instead of, <laughs> like we said in the beginning, it's not like, <laughs> one question, answer, straightforward, and jump to the next one. It's a conversation. Yeah, weird, so why not? <laughs> well, yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm only answering questions in a way in, in which to sound modest, interesting, and a guy you want to have a beer with. Um, it's all completely manipulative on my part, so. Fantastic. Same same as well. <laughs> it's all fake. Nothing nothing is real. Um no. So tell me, have you ever gone through kind of stunt training or martial arts training? Obviously you've done stage, so I'm sure there's been stage fights that you needed to deal with on on stage itself. What have you done and how does it work for you? Do you pick it up quickly? Um is it something that a little bit difficult for you? Do you enjoy it? Or do you try to avoid those as much as possible? Yeah, I I have a I have a strong instinct. Um, an ability and prowess for 
action stuff. I'm not an action actor per se, but I've, I keep finding myself, especially as my career started getting going, really, really in some of those um, kind of genre sequences. Um, look, uh, inherently with a sword, I always had a and, and blades and everything that was that's my that's kind of my area. Um, when I was in high school, I was captain of the fencing team. So it's always like that was something that was there. And then I had this strange, during that overseas odyssey in my 20s, when I had forsaken acting, I did, I, I found myself in New Zealand working on the show Spartacus doing stunts, uh, doing sword stunts. And that was just like, but, but I wasn't like an actor at that time. I literally was just trying to find gigs overseas and I found myself doing that. And then when, once I got back to acting, that kind of that ended up making its way. I, I did this um, TV show in Armenia called Death Squad that was uh, later sold for a time to CW. And I did all my own stunts with a machete there, chopping up zombies, fighting and all that stuff. And I was really, I, I, I do, I, and I was really able to kind of like make a lot of these shots look good and, and, and work and, and, and look proper and everything. I did it my way. I mean, I'm using this machete like a samurai sword or something. And look... It's kind of easy when you just have to like slice into hunks of meat that are zombies. They're not exactly fighting back; they're just trying to bite you. All you gotta do is just fucking just get them. Yeah, and then um, and then I found myself for a short time after that doing a lot of westerns and a lot of low budget westerns when I was kind of really cutting my teeth. And it was tons of tons of stunt stuff with that. Um, and yeah, so this was I would say like shooting and, and and guns is something that like that's a huge a huge area in, in the stunt world of course um that's always something i need like a really good refresher on and really need guidance because there's a lot of man you do something wrong with a gun all the motherfuckers online yeah. are commenting that like know, you look yeah. like a dumbass and i probably do but so <laughs> i always try to i always try to get that right when i can you yeah. know well, come, come to South Africa and join our team. I've got a stunt team that we are busy growing, so I'll teach you as much as I can. Um, oh, way so cool. You can always try to refresh you as much as possible. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd, I'd curiosity, one of, my, one of my really good friends, uh, incredibly accomplished actor, he's from South Africa. Have you ever gotten to know him? Uh, Greg Creek? He was he's, on he's, uh, yeah, Rebel Moon. Oh, he did? Yeah. Greg's, Greg, Greg's, my, Greg's one of my greatest greatest allies and friends out here in this town and those are those are hard to come by there are a few okay. I, I just did another movie i've done two movies with him one of which was one of those one of these westerns and we just yeah. we just wrapped a movie three months ago which we both got cast in as cousins un, like un, unrelated to the casting and the director knowing yeah. uh that we knew each other and oh I had a great yeah. time on that shoot with him yeah yeah he's uh he's, he's coming to my wedding up in italy yeah love that guy oh, fantastic no, he's, he's actually really, really nice. Um, yeah, I was able to, to chat to him a while back before he was doing the... Um, I can't even remember the name of the movie. I'm just go back and look at it. But he, he's done some amazing stuff as well. And he's grown drastically. He skyrocketed in his, his career, which is... Oh, he's always... I was just talking with him yesterday. And of course, like he was just coming off a set dude's always working he's like he's so talented everyone's like yeah. everyone always wants to get him involved so yeah. well he's a great guy fantastic guy as well um so it's a small world like <laughs> we know two of the same people okay obviously you know a lot more but i'm just saying um two of the people that i've interviewed you one of the the group now i've acted I've, I've acted i've acted with all three of them multiple cases yeah yeah well i mean eric eric roberts sort of has a finger in so many pies that it's almost like a rite of passage to be in a movie uh with him right? yeah i still don't understand he's like i hate putting it into a list or b list or anything else like that you know, there's always that category that two of them wants to be it but i i think he's such an underappreciated actor in my view such a lot of guy, an incredible person. Um, and something that's that's very, very interesting. And I haven't told many people this yet that I've, I've pitched a movie to him and um, he wants to be in it as well. Just going to be a very personal movie to me. It's about my dad. Um, and there's a very big likelihood that he's going to be playing my father. Wow. Just going to be very, very interesting. 
I'm petrified because I'm, I'm hoping to direct this thing as well, but it will be the second time directing Eric and I. Um, so it will be quite interesting. Oh, uh, that sounds, that Jeez. sounds super cool. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, it's sort of roasting as many people as I know. So. Yeah. Well, that's, that's how it, ta it takes a village and look, anytime a movie gets made, it's kind of like a miracle. All right. It involves, it involves pandering, begging, money laundering, and promises and breaking <laughs> promises. Three years at least in development, hell of it coming close and then utterly failing. And then basically having, cutting, having to chop the script, chop the budget, reformulate it. And then all yeah. of a sudden somebody needs to offload their Bitcoin in Saudi Arabia. And you've got to leave for some extra money. And then it falls through. And then a the guy who knows a guy <laughs> who wants to commit. Anywho, but they, I'm not, I'm not like a jaded, like <laughs> LA person over here. I promise. <laughs> well, if you are, it's fine. We'll talk all for you. And then we can uh, pass numbers if, if need be, because I definitely need some of those the context. <laughs> it would be Fair context. enough. Um, I'd avoid, I'd avoid okay, so the, uh, the Bitcoin guys in Riyadh though. They don't want. Yeah, you don't want no. that. It's not I'm real. Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not real. There's too many dodgy things out there. Sure. Um, I'm sure. Obviously, there's a couple movie that you can't speak about. But are there big epic ones that you are very excited for that that are on the cards? Well, obviously, don't give details. Just yeah, yeah. There's yeah. there's there's some very interesting things in speculation right now. Um, obviously, like. <laughs> I'm also just kind of taking things slow, seeing how the tailwinds of, of Hitman, you know, kind of hanging out at the number one spot streaming worldwide for a while. It's it pretty cool. So, um, but uh, yeah, right now I have, um, I've, I've got quite a few movies that are going to be coming out soon. I have a great Western uh, with uh, Dermot Moroni, Jacqueline Bessette, and... Um, and Dominic Monaghan, uh, yeah, coming out pretty soon. Um, particularly, okay. yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was a, a bandit, and I was the, I was the bad guy. I was the heavy, and I had a hell of a great time with that one. It was uh, directed by William Shockley and produced by Alan Gilmer and Tom Brady, and all, a pretty incredible team there through UTA as well. Um, excited to see what happens with that movie. And this uh, really fantastic movie coming out called uh, called Lake George. That's mm -hmm. I my character. They let me rip it with the improv, and it was hilarious. And there's all kinds of. There's so many cool movies coming out that I'm I'm always kind of excited to see where they land or what happens with them. Um, but it's been you know, and there's it's not that like oh I've been so movie and I I've been so busy and I have like nine movies coming out. But I I have been busy and there's nine movies coming out. But it's actually mostly because things have taken a long time in post-production and or the economy is so shaky that distributors are kind of wondering what to do with it. So there's stuff that I've done in the past two and a half years um, that still aren't out yet that I'm kind of curious. I mean, I, where I look completely, I, I mean, there was a whole era where, you know, like my hair was down all the way halfway past my back almost. And uh, so going back that far, it's tough. There's still, there's still stuff. And I'm just, so I'm kind of curious to see, to see what the sentiment of what all those are and how I should maneuver uh, going forward. Yeah. That's, it's a lot to look out for, so please let me know what they are and then I'll, I'll start pushing as much as we can from outside as well. Can I ask you, though, what is your most memorable moment on set where um, something weird or wacky had happened or something fantastic or heartbreaking or heartfelt? What is something that stands out to you? Yeah. These moments that you describe are the, the, they're the reason I do this, and they stay with me. They stay with me forever. And a lot of times when you're making a film, all you're searching for is like one extraordinary, genuine moment. It could be artistic. It could be... Every time you're making a movie, every time you're doing an acting scene, you're like, it's all building for something kind of magical to happen. And there's been, there's been a few of those moments. And... And... and I mean, one in particular. There's, there's two. There's two to really highlight um, for me. Um, I did this film where um, in, in Kentucky, where I was um, playing a pretty dreadful character. It was based on a true story of a a father that abused uh, his two children, and um, and he's he has this sort of showdown with them in this junkyard, and we shot in the middle of the night, 
and I'm working with these two extremely young actors. Um, I mean, seven and eight years old, and and they were just fantastic. And this was this movie was made six months after this event had occurred, and this this person that I was playing still existed in this town where we were shooting in Glasgow, Kentucky. A horrific, horrific sexual abuse kind of situation, and also um, sort of shedding insight, shedding light into the broken foster care system uh, in Kentucky, and. And this was and this was a real standout experience for me because you know we had talked briefly about about playing antagonists and playing playing bad people and how you know actors love to do it because they think it's so fun and how I I really look at those roles as a, as a pretty grand responsibility. I don't think people behave wickedly or evil for the sake of being evil. This isn't this isn't some some Disney kind of, you know, final boss in a video game kind of thing. Yeah. What I mean, Shane, we live in a world where terrible things happen. Horrific yeah. things happen. Um, and a lot of times we mostly choose to ignore them. Now, we know that in film, films are drama and dramatic things happen. And I don't like it when serious things are portrayed in films and they are portrayed casually like oh well people and audiences are used to drama so this person's gonna get killed it's a big deal when someone gets killed it's a big deal when someone makes a transition from being a normal everyday pedestrian in life to making a decision to harm another individual these are important things um to portray in film and television because they fucking happen and this and this really and i was one of those people that thought it was all casual or i could just watch something and with my popcorn and be entertained but this was real this had just happened and it was such an incredible opportunity and such a wonderful i mean wonderful opportunity for me to make that connection between what happens in life and what we see on film and television and and it was a rare opportunity to have that kind of perspective to gain that knowledge that what we do is important to a certain extent especially when we're portraying a true story and having to do that justice so no i'm not going to portray this character as some somebody evil and unattainable and just unlikable um because that's how our villains are viewed no this was a real guy a guy that a guy who social services didn't pay any attention to who people in the town didn't pay any attention to when his kids were acting funny and for me i had to i in preparing for that role and executing this highly dramatic scene i had to really make it real for me and it's not to say that like i have to like build up these circumstances for me to believe that i could do some harm to children in that kind of way but i did i did i did build a circumstance where i i believed that you know i loved my children very very much and i love my wife very very much uh and in this true story his wife had died previous to that and i really focused on how much i love my wife and how much i promised her on her deathbed that i was going to take care of our children that she didn't need to worry about it she could die peacefully she had some kind of thing where everyone knew she was going to be passing and something about that vivid promise, and this is all obviously imaginary circumstances that I built around what I saw in the text of the script, I focused so heavily on that promise and meant it so wholeheartedly, as we often do in life before we make mistakes, wonderful intentions, that in those moments of intensity of me behaving badly, and not that there, were, there was anything explicit in relation to what his behaviors were with those children, but there was things surrounding it that were suggested. Instead of, instead of focusing solely on, on believing in the act I was doing, I was focusing so much on the promise that I was breaking. And so often in people behaving badly, there is a part of them that's watching helplessly saying, stop, don't do this. This isn't you. And there's another part of them that's, in control and terrifying like in those moments when we see red right and and what i ended up experiencing as an actor in that scene 
w- was something so interesting. This this helplessness and extraordinary sorrow at what I was doing and this pain, which was which was sort of blending itself with this anger that I was feeling towards the children. And we shot this scene in the middle of the night, and I was just experiencing. I just experienced stuff really real. And and yeah, was it was it was I experiencing like true darkness? I think I was. And and I feel privileged to be able to go through that experience and learn these lessons as a human being. Um, and at the same time, do justice to the story. Not the saying that I have to do justice for this despicable human being that I was playing, who has since has fled the country when the movie came out, by the way, to Thailand. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but really, really, truly doing justice to those kids and under and, and and to victims out there with for example so many victims they get swayed by the victimizer and end up feeling bad for them because the victimizer tends to do that to them i had i had a one of my close friends who was a a, a victim of abuse was describing after he saw that movie he's like there was something so palpable and truthful about that because well, I'll just sort of build a quick circumstance here. As I'm like screaming at these children, I'm also kind of like crying in a way. Yeah. And he's like, that really reminded me of when, when my dad would abuse my mom and I, and he would feel bad after, and we wound up consoling him. And that's like something that's normal. And so like these complexities in the stories that we tell that mirror human life, real life are so interesting to me. And so to me, in, in short, like, it was a big lesson in, in, in playing the bad guy. And that bad guy also has to be somebody that's relatable. And yeah, yeah. Uh, how are we going to get an audience to relate to a child rapist? I'm not totally sure that you can, but they, but I want to show, I want to give them a little insight into the journey of how that happens. We hear about it on the news all the time. We say, well, that's fucked up and that's terrible. Mm-hmm. We don't want to think anything further of it because there's nothing more terrifying and grotesque to even start to imagine about it. Anyway, that's the that's the long answer to your question. That was that was the most significant no, experience I, I ever had as an actor. Well, that that's what you're explaining there is so real to hear that from you as well. Which is, I'm grateful that you did. It's, it's it makes you realize that you still have to see the humane and inhumane side of the person that you're portraying, and also the people that are doing all the bad crimes and and rape and abuse and all that as well. Uh, I've got a very strong sense of anti-abuse um being the martial arts world i've always done all the the rape awareness courses and the high death awareness courses here yeah, and all that because of, i always feel that protecting people is is very important but you have to think like like a criminal to be able to to portray what is needed so that the people who are trying to defend themselves can actually understand what is going through that person's mindset you know and no. it's, it's great that you're saying that because it's hard to it's hard to explain that and get people to understand it. Thank you. It's psycho. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> totally. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. That's quite a thing. So thank you so much. Um, what's the name of that movie? Or can't you say? Uh, that is a movie called, oh yeah, no, that's, that, that's out there. Uh, that's the movie's called hard to place. And it was, the movie was put together, um, by, uh, the Christ and Youth Foundation, and I believe it's like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and then the movie was was sort of through the festivals, and then it was something that they were showing in foster care communities, particularly in churches uh, and everything. But it wasn't made for any kind of type of distribution. But you can watch it on Amazon, and it's short, yeah. like twenty minutes, something like that. That's more impactful as well. It should be too well winded with all this whole. Goal. Yeah. 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 Um, All right. So a little bit lighthearted. You're going to be moving on to two uh, different elements. The first one that I'm going to ask you first is if you had any advice for any up and coming actor, someone who is wanting to get to where you are, what would that advice be from Wilson? Huh. Yeah. You know, as someone who's tried to not do this. As someone who's tried to not do this career multiple times um, because of the inherent anguish that comes that comes with the process of doing it, um, not you know not not particularly the difficulties of the work itself, but just the the pursuit of it is obviously 
difficult. I would say do this if you have to do this. And the first time, my first go of it when I was younger in LA, I think I had stars in my eyes and it, and it led me, it led me to a crisis. And so there I realized that I didn't have a passion for acting or if I did, it sort of just transformed into a passion for wanting people to like you. That's, that's what wanting stardom is or fame or whatever. So that's, that's crap. So it's, I promise you, if you're in it, if you're in it because you want people to look at you, I mean, technically speaking, that's, <laughs> that's going to happen. But if that's your reason, I don't think, I don't think you'll have the capacity to make it through the trials and tribulations of what this thing really takes, which is an extraordinary amount of rejection, holding a magnifying glass to your faults, which are accentuated and redoubled back onto you every single day. So my first bit of advice is really understand that this is something I firmly believe it's something you do because you have to do. Um, yeah. And every single try, time I tried to do something else, I've had some cool setups in some other countries living ide idyllically to a certain extent. And, and I realized that something was always leading me back to this. Do it if you have to do it. And those who have to do it should be doing it because you have a responsibility. Um, and, and, if you, and if you figure that out and you're in it and you're having struggles, sometimes actually all you have to do is not quit. And it becomes, at a certain point, first it starts off as not a decision, right? You're like, oh, I'm not going to quit. I, I'm doing this. And then as things get tougher and tougher, and you get, like, some bad reviews, and you think you're a bad actor, or you get really close to close on something, and it doesn't work out, and it happens 50 times in a row, sometimes all you have to do is not quit. Do not, like, all you, sometimes all you have to do is stay in it. And you look at, like, Brian Cranston, who, like was in this industry for like years before before it really truly panned out for him in a, in a huge way and he could have like you know he was making some good money doing commercials and and, and bit parts and he could have he's like well when am i going to get to you know do anything of substance and perhaps this is not going to happen i'm getting bored with this there's this great offer from my brother-in-law this insurance sales kind of thing this would be much more steady for my kids i'm going to quit and do this uh, I, I actually just completely made that circumstance up, but <laughs> I, I don't know if Brian Cranston had it. I don't know if Brian Cranston had a brother-in-law that made him an offer uh, at an insurance company, and, and then you know he could for sure pay for his kids. I don't even know if he had kids at that time. He probably did. Looks like a dad. Um, yeah. So yeah, don't quit. Uh, if you want it, you want it bad enough. And I and I'll quote. I'll quote. Keith Ledger here from 10 Things I Hate About You. Mm. Don't ever let someone tell you that you don't deserve what you want. And um, at the end of the day, if, if you want this, you can get it. There's there's enough content being made. There's enough ways to make this happen. So. Cool. Thank you so much. Just, um, I really like those kind of words of advice because it resonates with what I'm trying to do and it's, it's all about doing what you have to get because you're either thrown into the situation you've got no other choice or it's because it's made for you and you just got to run with it and do the best that you can and that's what that's what you try to do and there's no quick fix you know you're not going to become a hollywood star overnight unless you are the luckiest person in the world who <laughs> gets found it happens it happens, <laughs> yeah, it happens <laughs> but but it's not that easy We're going to play a little bit of your game, if you're up for it. We've got 10 cards, 10 questions. Okay, they're going to be quotes from different movies. Oh, shit, the title of this game. <laughs> <laughs> You've already given us one quote, so I think you, you're ahead of the game here. Um, this is called The Champion Ladder. So what I like doing is to see how many you can get right. Just for fun. There's no, nothing gets right or anything else like that. It's just a... I could tap on the, the back to say, yeah, I did it. All right, but if I, I fail hard, if I fail hard on this, Shane, you're going to have to edit it out, okay, buddy? Okay, I'll, I'll give you two answers, the right one or the right one. I'll put all the right ones in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So, 10 questions. I'm going to give you the quote, um, and then you just have to try and figure out where this movie's from. Or where oh, so it's like, from, which... Oh, I see. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. 
Quite simple. I hope. All right. First one. I'll give you some clues later on if you need it as well, but this is from a 1997 movie. The quote is as follows. I'm the king of the world. Uh, that's Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. Well done. Straight away. Such an easy one, right? Have to start off on the easy ones. If we, know, if we just kind of keep, if we can keep them at that level, I might do fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what order, order they're in, so please excuse me. All right, so next one. 1983. How far back do you, go, do you know your movies? Okay. Say hello to my little friend. Oh, that's uh, Scarface. See, told you to stop at that. See, it's a little bit more intimidating. Starting with, starting with, starting with the iconic ones. That's good. <laughs> iconic ones. Okay, the next one's very, very simple. 1985. Okay. Great Scott. Uh, back to the Future. Back to the Future. This one's going to be a little bit harder. Yeah. Just, 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 I haven't seen Deer Hunter, so no, none of that shit, okay? <laughs> oh, no, don't worry, I haven't seen none of that. <laughs> okay, so, it's a 2002 movie. Uh, who are you? Are you Tradestone? Give it to me one more time. Who are you? Are you Tradestone? Are you Tradestone? Tradestone, yes. No idea. No idea? Hmm. <clears throat> Born Identity. Oh, yeah. Do you remember he's on the call? It's like, who are you guys? Who's Tristan? All right, um, the next one is very simple. Very, very simple. Okay. So far, you're doing very well. You got one out of four, so far? Well, three out of four. Three out of, two or three out of four. Yeah, you, mean, right? you got one wrong out of, out of all four. Oh, gotcha. Fair enough. 1986. Okay. Okay. I feel the need, the need for speed. Oh, is the, it's like... Uh, Tom Cruise, right, in, like, Days of Thunder or something? Or is that, is that wrong? Oh, shit. Almost. Give you, um, a, I'll give you another chance. He's made a sequel recently. Oh, fuck me. Top Gun. <laughs> there we go. Sensible. I'll be nice. You know, I know somebody in that sequel. Oh. Do you? Well, yeah, Glenn Powell. He's who I was with in uh, Hitman. He's the... Uh, oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a new thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm dying to get all of those people. Um, I should have. Eight, 86. Yeah, of course that was a tough <laughs> idiot. <laughs> it's such an, an easy phrase, but anything that has any kind of speed or whatever you want to just relate it to that, because you always think about Tom Cruise. Or yeah, because he's always. He did yeah. so many high voltage kind of things there. Yeah, and yeah. Probably, he probably felt the need for speed multiple times in, in every single one of them. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, okay, next one. No, yeah. I'm just going to give you the, the phrase. My precious. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Andy Serkis, Lord of the Rings. Well done. And, and any of those. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant movie as well. Okay, next one. 2000 movie. <clears throat> they might be making a sequel, apparently. Death smiles at us all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Death smiles at us all. All a man can do is smile back. All right, so I'm going to take the year 2000, and I'm going to take the potential sequel, and I'll say Gladiator. No, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I shouldn't just say the sequel part. Um, <laughs> 1990. Why didn't you go upon to house rattle chains or something? Um. Okay, so I mean. So basically, it's a it's a character interacting with a ghost. So the movie could be Ghost, and I don't think that was Beetlejuice. I'll say Ghost. No, Ghost. Well then, hey, exactly. Yes. All right. Okay, nineteen ninety five. <clears throat> Slightly difficult one. That nah, should be easy. Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, yeah. Power thirteen. Okay. You're doing pretty well. Go one left. Okay. This is an oldie. But it's been used so many times as well. 1931, they've made many of this movie. Okay, they remade this movie like you cannot believe. 1931, and the quote is Listen to them, children of the night, what music they make. It's hot. <clears throat> you need it again. Yeah, yeah. Listen to them, children of the night. What music they make? 
Dracula something? No. Is that your final answer? Yeah. Spot on. How did you get that? <laughs> because I, it's Dracula. It's Dracula. Oh man! How did you get those? Because uh, I don't know that one at all. You know, I've uh, read it so many times that I can never remember. A deduction. <laughs> of the, you know, all the remakes. I, uh, it's something like that. Well, it just kind of made sense uh, to me. But yeah, wow, not bad there. You know, the yeah, audience. I think that you gave me the answers in advance. I did so good. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did not. Yeah, the other disclaimer: there were no in the arts and given before. Whatever. If you really need to, then I'll stack up other ones that you can also go through just to prove them wrong. But you're not going to do that to you. So, <laughs> so yeah. But I just want to say thank you so much. Before we do say goodbye to you, I'd like to know um, what is the best way for your fans, our coming fans, or people that really like the, the latest movie, Hickman? How can they start following you, seeing what you're up to, and, and what's, what's coming sure. and legal in? Yeah, all, 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 of my, all of my updates go through my Instagram, which is just uh, the Mike Markoff with the blue check mark. Not the imposters. Not that there's very many imposters. I may have. I think I maybe built a couple of imposters to build in tree. So <laughs> you can't say this out loud. Though. <laughs> Whoops! What? Nah. nah, nah. <laughs> I think I, I think I, I one of them is like a failed attempt of me trying to start an Instagram in like 2011, yeah, uh, or something like that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not an imposter. No, the disclaimer is not only possible, but fantastic. Mike, thank you so much. I think the information that you've given us so far is is incredible, and I really, really appreciate your time and your your willingness to to share what you've gone through and what what is clearly passionate to you. So, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I really do hope when you are here in South Africa, if anyone does want to actually hound him and get the paparazzi after him, he might be here away in November. Hey. Uh, the days. No, it's November. Oh, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, no, but if you do come out to South Africa, it would be an honor to meet you, and um, I'd like to just have a have a beer with you. It could be great. That would be awesome, Shane. But yeah, really great talk uh, with you. And thank you. You know, as you know, actors love talking about themselves. So I just had a ball. <laughs>